All right, if you'll please take your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to two places. If you'll go to the New Testament, to the book of James, James chapter 5. Now I'm going to go to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30 is the verse we've been using as a springboard into what we've been talking about. So Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30, the Bible says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. And we've been talking about he that winneth souls is wise. And uh, we want to continue uh, down that path tonight. And so let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we need you. That's why we come together tonight uh, to hear from you. Thank you for already encouraging us this night. Thank you for the health and strength and all that you give us, the desire to even be in your house with your people. And Father, we need ears to hear tonight and a heart to not only hear but to do. And would you give us that? Would you help us to put aside the storms in life right now that, that we're being bombarded with, the temptations of our flesh, uh, the temptations, um, whether they're something severely wicked or just the temptation not to, not to do the right thing um, and obey you. And so, Lord, we, we need you. Please guide me tonight. Please give us liberty. Lord, as we talk about prayer, as we talk about spending time with you in prayer, would you make it more real to us? And will we have a burning desire for this part of our life um, that can be easily neglected because of the business of life? And we'll thank you for what you do in our hearts and lives tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we started off talking about he that winneth souls, obviously about soul winning and how to lead somebody to Christ, how to tell them about Christ. And, um, and then, of course, we would love for them to make the decision to receive Christ as their Savior. And that's the assumption that we made is that when we give the gospel and we talk about Jesus and what he's done for someone, they're going to receive Christ as their Savior. But we don't want to just leave them there. We want to help them to learn how to do the Lord's will for their life. Now, it is hard to tell somebody how to do the Lord's will for their life if we don't know how to do the Lord's will for our life. Okay, it's, you're never going to teach somebody how to drive a vehicle if you don't know how to drive a vehicle. Okay, now you can read the manual and you can give them all the things and maybe they can figure it out from what you're telling them. But in order to tell somebody something and help them with something, you have to be doing it yourself. And so this is, this is a, an encouragement for us. The things we're talking about coming out of salvation in our life are very important. Now, we're talking about helping somebody who's a new believer and knowing God's will and obviously getting them grounded on the fact that they have eternal life through Jesus Christ. After they received him, they have this and other things as well we can let them know about. But we start telling them about this sanctification process. And as we're telling them, it always helps me to tell somebody else what I already know. Uh, I found many times as I preach or I teach the Bible, um, the Lord's convicting me and saying, hey, you forgot about this, and, uh, and really helping me in my own life. So it's a double-edged sword. We're trying to talk about things to give to a new believer or a believer who's not been walking with God that needs to get to walking with God. And we talk about this sanctification process that's taking place in a person's life, and it only continues to take place in their life as a person surrenders to the Lord. Or you could say yields to the Lord uh, there. And so in the process of that, when a person surrenders and they're yielded to the Lord, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. That means that the Lord has all of us now. When we got saved, and it's important for the new believer to understand this, when they got saved and we got saved, we had all the Holy Spirit that we're ever going to get. We, don't, we didn't get an installment plan. We didn't get 10% of the Holy Spirit when we got saved. And as we walk with him, we get 5% more and 1% more. And depending on what we do, we get percentages. No, we got all of God. When you got saved, you got all of them. And at the moment, he had all of you. When you trusted him and turned to him and believed on Christ as your Savior. But as we walk day to day, 
if we don't yield to him, he no longer has all of us. And he needs all of us. So it's a great reminder to us. But when, but when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, or you can say when we're yielded, or when we're surrendered to the Lord, obviously the Holy Spirit is leading us to do something. And that's to obey the Lord in our life. And one of the areas that we've already talked about was the Word of God. What do we do with the Word of God? Why do we even have the Word of God? If we're not going to open it, why do we even have it as believers? If we're not going to let it dictate our life, then what's it for? And the Holy Spirit urges us to get into the Word of God and to, to spiritually eat it and take it in and to find nourishment and direction and guidance in our life as He does that. And then we found another area that we're talking about right now is prayer. And so the surrendered believer quickly will find out not only that the Word of God is very important to them because it's important to the Lord, but prayer becomes a necessary part of life. We talked about some general teachings already about prayer and the Word of God. Then we looked at some, some, uh, uh, some of the teachings that Jesus had about prayer. And now we're looking at the book of James and what the book of James teaches us about prayer. And in James chapter 5 and verse 15, the Bible says this, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And we're, we really focused in on the part of that verse that says the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith. And we started looking at the fact that, obviously, I think, I think that the two most Two important things in a believer's life is reading the Word of God and studying it. Obviously, all that going together, everything we do with the Word of God, and prayer. Because this is how the Lord speaks to us, and this is how we speak to the Lord. And it should be, that's a relationship. Anybody that has a relationship has those two things going on. You talk to a person, and a person talks to you. If there's not two people talking, then there's no communication. Um, you're just having a conversation with yourself. And so prayer throughout the book of James, coupled with faith, is a theme that completely runs through it. And that's what we've been looking at. Uh, in chapter 1, we saw that the Lord gives us an invitation to prayer. He said, let them ask of God. Come, come ask. If you're lacking wisdom, let them ask. So there was an invitation, and we have to accept it, and that invitation is accepted by faith. And we learned that as we accept that invitation by faith, we live the Christian life the same way by faith. And then as we're living the Christian life by faith, we're maturing by faith. We learned all that in the first three chapters, and we just skimmed them just looking at some things there. It's all by faith. Accepting God's invitation to prayer is by faith. Then we saw that the Lord gives us an instruction in prayer in chapter 4. And the Lord instructed us here in, chapter, in verse 2, 3, 4, and 5 that if, if we're going to pray, then what's going to be required is that we must ask, right? That's just very simple. We must ask. And sometimes we just neglect asking. And then if we do ask, we understood that if you're going to follow this instruction of prayer that he's given, that you have to ask in his will. Then the Lord instructed us that we must be in right fellowship with him as we are asking in his will. And so we found that instruction about prayer. And tonight we come to chapter 5, and we're going we're gonna to sit right here in chapter 5 and verses 15 through 18, and we're going to see the Lord gives us an illustration of prayer. An illustration of prayer. Let's look at these verses. Verse 15 again says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions, as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit." So the Lord gives us this illustration. And first of all, what we find is the man the Lord used. The man that the Lord used. Now we find in verse 17 that the Bible says the man's name is Elias. Old Testament name is Elijah. This is Elijah here. This man 
the Bible tells us here in verse 17, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. So the man that the Lord used, he had fleshly desires just like we have, but the Lord used him. That would be very encouraging to you. Again, I'll tell you, the people you read about in the Bible, they weren't special people. The only special person in the Bible was the God-man, Christ Jesus. Outside of that, everybody else has a sin nature, and everybody else has natural desires just like we do, and every man is tempted with the same temptations that you and I are, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But these people in the Bible were still used. So why? Why did the Lord use him? Because he had faith when he prayed. The Bible says in verse 15, the prayer of faith. And he gives us this illustration of this man who had like passions as we do. He had the same desires for things that God didn't want him to have as we do, but he said he still used him in the midst of all those other people. And then the prayer, we're going to see the prayer the Lord answered. Not only the man the Lord used, which was Elias or Elijah, but the prayer the Lord answered, that the Lord answered. Why don't you look at verse 16? It says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Now that's what we ought to be doing. We ought to pray for each other. You know, and then we'll, we'll come and we'll pray. We'll pray for people when they're sick. We'll, uh, uh, just like the previous verse in verse 14 said, is there any sick among you? You take the oil, you anoint them, and you pray for them. We'll do that. If somebody wants to do that, we'll do that. We believe that's biblical. But the Bible says here about this prayer in verse 16, it says, after it says that, praying one for another that you may be healed, it says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So the prayer that the Lord answered. So first of all, we find that we must have effectual prayer. You're taking notes, right? You're writing this down. We must have effectual prayer. The word effectual means a power or force to produce an effect. A power or force to produce an effect. The same Greek word is translated in other passages as show, uh, as show forth or worketh, mighty, wrought, and to do. So there's something that gets done because of this prayer because it is effectual. And our prayers will not have any effect unless we exercise biblical faith and the Lord's power works mightily through us. There's going to be no effect. It will not affect us. It will not affect others that are praying with us. Others that we are praying for. It will have no effect for them. The ones that are sick that need to be healed that we pray for, it won't help at all if it's not effectual. And it will not move the Lord to, do, uh, to doing a work that will affect anything else if it's not effectual prayer. So the Bible says our prayer has to be effectual. And I think it becomes effectual just like the rest of these things. It's by faith. Because it, it, it was already told us in verse 15, the prayer of faith. Then secondly, not only we must have effectual prayer, because that's going to get answered, but we must have fervent prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer, the Bible says here. Fervent prayer. The word fervent means to be excited. It means to be earnest about something. It carries the idea of not ceasing to do something. Working on it. Moving forward in it. In the context, it's referring to praying like this for the healing of the sick. So we pray. Then we pray again. Then we pray again. Then we come again fervently. And then we come again. And then we come again. That's that asking and seeking and knocking and to keep asking, to keep seeking, to keep knocking. That's the fervent idea of it. But the thought is connected here also to the illustration of prayer in the life of Elijah. He must have been a man that had effectual prayers, but fervent prayers. Walking with the Lord. Usually when we are excited about something, it's because we have invested something in it. And we get excited about it. 
We might be excited about a new car or a new house. Well, those are some investments. So I hope you're excited about it if you get a new vehicle or a new house because you made investment and you're still making an investment. Um, or if you, look, if someone starts their own business, look, they're going to be fervent about that. They just laid a lot of money on the line to start this business. Fervency. Fervency. If they don't, something's wrong there. They just want to waste some money. Well, time and prayer. That's an investment. That's why people don't pray. Because it takes time. And prayer is work. It's a work to pray. If it was easy, everybody would do it. There's an investment in prayer. What about your money? What about putting your money into what you're praying about? That's an investment. So let's say like, we're praying about souls being saved. Well, there's two things that are going to happen if you're praying for souls to be saved and if you're being fervent about it. You're going to try to tell souls about, about Christ. You're going to be a soul winner because if you don't hear the gospel, they're not going to get saved. But you're probably also going to give money to the World Evangelism Fund so that we can get missionaries to the foreign field so they can give the gospel so that people can hear the gospel in a place where we're never going to go, most likely, and they can get saved. It's an investment. And then you're going to be praying for those missionaries, and you're going to be praying for those people in that place because you've got an investment in it. Usually when we get excited about something, we don't want it to end. Right? Whatever you like. could be a football game. Sometimes you want it to end if it's not going the way you want it to go. But, yeah, I mean, you just, you, whatever you like doing, you don't want it to end. You're excited about it. But that's the way it should be when you pray. And if you've ever been in that prayer time and you got fervent about it and you got excited about it, you don't want to leave. You don't want to leave. What about when you're studying the Word of God and you get fervent into studying the Word of God? You don't want to leave because you're excited about it. Have you ever been that where soul winning? Sometimes it's hard to get going soul winning. But once you get going to soul winning and you start talking to some people, then you want to keep talking to the next person. Those things have fervency about them. Usually when we're excited about something, it's because of what we receive from it. Like a marriage. We receive something in marriage from the other person. I mean, you can be excited without receiving that, but it sure is more exciting when you receive something from them, like a, a, a relationship and a, and a friendship within marriage. Uh, any relationships like that, uh, in time with the Lord, it's exciting because we just don't go and talk. It should be a time where the Lord's talking to you. That's exciting because we're getting something from it. We're getting something from the Lord's presence as we spend time with Him. When you get in the Word of God, um, there's something that you can receive from the Word of God. And He can speak to you. And He can give you direction. He can help you. He can encourage you. He can rebuke you from His Word. Whatever He needs to do, He can do it. And that should be exciting that the Lord is speaking to you. So we have effectual prayer. That gets the Lord to answer, fervent prayer. But then the Bible says in verse 17, it says earnest prayer. So we must have earnest prayer. Look at verse 17. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Earnest prayer. The word earnestly here means to be sincere and it carries the idea of worship from the heart that leads us to speak with our mouths. Earnestness. It's not fake. It's not feigned. You're not putting on. You're not being a hypocrite. It's truly from the heart. And it's earnest. Look at Luke chapter 22. In verse 44. You remember here, Jesus being in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
And the Bible tells us in verse 44 of Luke 22, And being in agony, talking about Jesus, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He was in great agony. But he didn't stop. He was even more earnest. And I can't help but to think that wrapped up in that earnestness is effectual fervence in there as well. And he didn't stop. He just continued to go. Jesus prayed earnestly. Now let's take a look back at 1 Kings chapter 17 because this is where we find Elijah. And this is where we find the, the story of what James chapter 5 is talking about. First Kings chapter 17, let's go to verse 1. So we see Ahab is the king, and this is when uh, Elijah pops up on the scene. And the Bible says in verse 1 of 1 Kings 17, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So that's what the reference is being made of. And I can't help but to think that the earnest prayer of Elijah that it was talking about in verse 17 is hearkening back to verse 16 there in James chapter 5 that said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. And he was being earnest and sincere from his heart seeking the Lord in this kind of way, and the Lord did this. There is no record in 1 Kings 17 that Elijah prayed for there to be no rain. There's no record. He just told the king there's going to be no rain. But in verse, um, verse, verses 17 and 18, back in James chapter 5, it gives us a little more insight and to what was going on, it said, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly. So there, he was praying, but we're not told he was praying back in 1 Kings. And he was praying earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth, forth her fruit. Insight. All he said was, King Ahab, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. But what was he doing before he went and stood before the king? He was standing before God. And he was praying earnestly and seeking him. And then I want to tell you this, that we must not only have earnestness, but we also must have confident prayer. Confident prayer. In verse 18 of James chapter 5, the Bible says this, And he prayed again, and, heaven gave, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So if you're going to pray again, then you prayed previously. And so that's what he's doing. And obviously we're told that he prayed and didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed, and then he gave forth the rain again. Let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 18. Well, first Kings, but in chapter 18 now. So he told the, he told the king Ahab, he said, it's not going to rain three and a half years. Or um, he actually said there should be no dew or rain these years, but according to my word. He didn't even tell him three and a half years there. He just said, look, there's not going to be rain. Then in verse, uh, chapter 18, in verse 1, it said, And it came to pass, after many days, the word of the Lord came unto Elijah in the third year, saying... Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So the Lord revealed his will to Elijah. When we find here. Now I believe the Lord also did the same thing before Elisha spoke with Ahab the first time. So you have to understand as you're reading the scriptures, this is how the Lord was talking to Elijah. So I can imagine this same conversation happened, and he told him basically the same thing. Okay, go to Ahab and tell him now it's not going to rain. And he was spending time with the Lord, and he was confident. He had prayed, earnestly sought the Lord, 
And he said, okay, I'm going to go. Now, nobody wanted to go to King Ahab. Elijah didn't want to go to King Ahab. But he went to King Ahab because the Lord said it's not going to rain. And he went and told him it wasn't going to rain. And he went with confidence. But when he went back, he was confident because the Lord also told him, go back now and tell him it is going to rain. After three years, he said, go back. And so by the time he had told him that to when he went back, it was three and a half years at this point that he went back and told him this. Now look at 1 John chapter 5. Keep your hand there in 1 Kings, but go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. And look at verse 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him. And by the way, our confidence is always in the Lord. This is the confidence we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So there goes that instruction that we were given back in James chapter 4 that if we're just asking amiss, there is no confidence that we're asking in his will and there is no confidence that we'll have what we ask for. But here we have a confidence because we know that we have eternal life in verse 13 and we know that because we have eternal life that we can continue to believe on Him for everything else. And then we have this confidence because He's given us what we've believed on Him for to begin with. Now we can just trust Him with everything else in our life besides our salvation. Now we're confident and we ask Him in His will. We know He hears us. And verse 15 says, And if we know that He hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. There's a bunch of knowing going on in these verses. And if you know something, that means you're confident of it. You're confident. And we know, we need to know the Lord's will so that we can ask it and have complete confidence in His provision for us. Now, both times He was confident, and I, and I, and I don't believe Elijah, 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 sorry, Elijah was confident in himself. If it was just his confidence, he'd have never went to King Ahab. We find that in other parts of the story. He didn't want to face that. He didn't want to face the whole situation. He didn't want to face his wife or King Ahab or the prophets. He didn't want to face anybody. But because of the Lord, he did. And his confidence was in the Lord. And if we're going to have confidence, it's got to be in the Lord. You know what our flesh is going to tell us? You can't do it. You can't do it. None of you can do it. That's what your flesh is going to tell you. Or your flesh is going to tell you you can do it. And you don't need the Lord. Either you, they're both pride. I can't do it. And I'm not going to trust the Lord with it because I know I can't do it. Or I can do it and I'm going to leave the Lord out of it. Either way, it's wrong. You just need to be confident in the Lord. You need to go ahead and just say, yeah, I can't do it. You might be better at something than another thing, but just go ahead and just realize and just give it to God and say, Lord, I know I can't do anything without you, and so I just need you for everything. And, uh, and that would be the best way to do it. Now let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 18 and look at what he tells, what he tells here uh, to King Ahab. 1 Kings 18, and now we're going to go toward the end of the chapter in verse 41. And look what the Bible says. In Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Now, it has been three and a half years since there's been any rain. And Ahab is probably thinking, okay, you're crazy, but you did say it wasn't going to rain, and it's not raining. So is it really going to rain? Because you're saying it again. It's abundance of rain coming. And then he says, So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. Now, I can't help but to think he's praying here. This is his, he prayed again. He's earnestly seeking the Lord again. Not only back in verse 1 when he was seeking him, the Lord told him what to say, but now he's seeking him again. He's on, he's on the mountain. He knows it's coming and he's praying and he said to his servant, go now and look toward the sea. He's like, I'm going to pray it sounds a little bit like Jesus, doesn't it? I'm going to pray. You guys just watch. Watch with me. And he told the servant, go look. 
Go watch. Go watch. Go tell me what you see. I'm going to pray. He's praying. Go see. And he went and looked and said, there's nothing. Elijah, he said, go again seven times. Just keep going till you see something. I'm praying. You just keep going. You give me a report. You keep going. Give me a report. I'm talking to God. You go tell me. Is the rain coming? And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there arises a little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up. Say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind. And there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. It had nothing to do with Elijah. It was about the Lord. And ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. By the way, I'd like to have seen that. <laughs> him outrunning the chariots and him outrunning the people and uh, getting there. Um, He's confident in prayer. Now look, it, there's been times I've prayed that it would rain, and it didn't. There's been times I've prayed that it would rain, and it did. There's been times I've prayed that it wouldn't rain, and the Lord gave us rain anyway. And there's been times that I've prayed, and it seemed like the Lord answered that it wouldn't rain and held it off for something that was going on. But it's amazing how confident he was. As he talks to the Lord, I think we can be this confident in our lives. If we're walking with God, that we can ask God for something and he gives us peace about it. And we know it's in accord with the word of God. And we're having comfort of the Holy Spirit as we're praying and talking about it, that we can pray about it. And then we can pray something else and know that the Lord would have us to pray that and to go that direction. And you can be confident in that. We need that confidence in our life. See, this illustration has to do with the power of the Holy Spirit working through us in prayer. And our life can be and should be an illustration of the prayer of faith. That's what our life should be. And biblical faith allows us to be in fellowship with the Lord. And it also allows us to pray in the Lord's will for our life. And then it allows our prayers to be effectual, fervent, earnest, and confident. So the question is, what are we waiting for to exercise the prayer of faith? It's just we're not starting to do it. You've got to start somewhere. It's like with the Bible. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start later. You've got to start somewhere. You better start reading in some chapter of the Bible. You better start trying to study your Bible somewhere. Now, there are some good places I tell you not to, and there are some good places to start as well. And then you can start praying, right? Just talking to the Lord. Be confident, effectual. As you spend time with the Lord, you'll want to spend more time with Him. This is the illustration of, of prayer that we find here of Elijah. Father, help us tonight. Help us to respond to you because this is the kind of prayer life we need. And maybe we would even say we want it. But maybe we don't have it. And it maybe seems something that's unattainable. And really with us it is because we don't we don't like some people like to think that they twist your arm and make you do things because of their amount of faith that they have. We don't believe that. We don't see that from the scriptures. But we know we can be confident in you. And we know we can come to you, Lord. And we can just lay ourselves before you. And know that there's nothing in us. And that if we pray for anybody that's sick, it's going to have to be you that takes care of that. If we pray... For more wisdom, it's going to just be you that's going to help us with that. If we're seeking you by faith to be a mature believer and we're asking you for that, it's going to be you that will help us to walk consistently before you. And that we could cry out to you with fervency 
that our prayers would be effectual because of the earnestness that you've given us and put in us as we walk with you. And we can be so confident in what you're doing, what you're doing in our lives, what you're doing in other people's lives. And would this be something that we see in our lives? Would this be a, a, a product of our walk with you that maybe we're not having right now, maybe we haven't had in a long time, or maybe we are. Maybe this is what we're living. Whatever the situation, Lord, uh, would we continue? Continue to move forward in this. Continue to seek you. And would you help us to help other people to understand about prayer, about what you tell us to do in, the, in your word, and have this sweet communion with you? And we thank you, Lord. I pray you'd help us now to respond to you accordingly as you've spoken to us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, altars are open. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, I'm lost. I'm not 100% sure if I die tonight. I'm on my way to heaven. Could be. You could be here on this Wednesday night service and you don't know that you're on your way to heaven tonight. I'll tell you this. You can't put your trust in yourself to get to heaven. You have to believe on Jesus Christ and in his death, burial, and resurrection and that that was enough to pay for your sins. Nothing else can do it. You've already messed up. You're a sinner separated from God. But Jesus came without sin to be, become sin for you, to be made sin for you, to become you, to pay for your sins. And he did. And if you'll receive him as your Savior, then he can save you. He can forgive your sins. He can give you eternal life. Have a home in heaven with him. Would you take care of that tonight? That's you. Maybe you're a believer here tonight. I, I trust most are. Are you praying effectually? Are you praying fervently? Is your prayer earnest from your heart? Is your prayer confidence? Would that be how you describe your prayer life? As confident? I try to encourage you this way. Wherever you're at, you need to start there. And you need to move from there. Maybe you're none of these things. Maybe you're already all these things. Well, you need to continue and move forward in what the Lord have you to do. There's always progress that we make because the Lord is always moving forward. He's always working in this world, and we want to be part of that. So if we just, if we have a good prayer life right now, a year from now won't be too good if we're not moving forward with God in prayer. If you think you're okay. I'm trying to encourage you to keep seeking the Lord in the prayer of faith. Father, would you seal these things in our hearts tonight? Sometimes I, I believe that people can't see what prayer is doing because it's by faith. And so they don't see a need for it. And so we just can't lay our hands on it. And so we don't do it. But Father, would you give us, give us the spiritual discernment tonight to understand that prayer is a great weapon in this spiritual war that we're facing and that is taking place around this world. And would you help us to take it more serious than we are? Would you help us to be more effectual and fervent and earnest and confident in our prayer life? As we do ask, as we do come in your will, that our life would be enriched, that things would happen because you're able to do that. And we believe you and we ask it for you, from you, to do that in someone else's life, in our life, in this world. And Father, we're looking for your coming back. We're looking for your return tonight. Help us be faithful to you. Thank you for being faithful to us. And thank you for making it even possible that we can come before your throne and find help in the time of need. 
and we want to honor and glorify you this week. And we want some things to be different in our lives and around this world and in our communities because of our prayer life. And would you help us to walk that way? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make Him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.